Happy Sabbath. Good morning. We've already had a little taste of heaven. Don't you sense that when you sing these hymns? And I'm wondering when you sing these hymns, when we're singing these hymns, that's when I really pay attention to what they're saying. I read the words as I'm listening to you sing. And uh, they're sermons in themselves. And I want to re review just a couple of things from that. But before I do that, I have to tell you what I was sitting here thinking as we were singing those hymns. Those hymns brought back to mind to me some things from my youth when I was a boy and a young teenager. Two things. Number one, I have a cousin who's about a year and a half older than I, and we got into all kinds of mischief when we was young. One day, he told me, he said, uh, we going deer hunting. How are we gonna do that? All we have are BB guns. And he said to me, if you take a 22 rifle cartridge and you put it on your BB gun, you tape it on there and you fire your gun, that pellet will strike the sweet point on that cartridge and we have ourselves a rifle. I said, really? He said, yes. So we got us a few cartridges. We went out in the woods, and we're going to test this theory. Stay with me. We laid down one BB gun. We took the one, and, and we propped it up vertically. And, we, and he balanced that cartridge right on top while I held it steady. And he pulled the trigger, and the cartridge fell off. Recocked it again, and he put it up there a second time. I held it at a distance. He pulled a trigger, and the cartridge fell off. I began to think, this doesn't work. At some point, during that exercise, I don't remember how many times we tried it. At some point, he pulled a trigger, and lo and behold, pow, it fired. And when it fired, since we were that close, it was very loud. I grabbed my ear and I went down to the ground and I was, my ear was ringing and I was shaking my head and he said, you all right? I said, yeah, my ear just like that loudness just got, he said, no, you're bleeding. I was struck. I was grazed across just above my ear. I took the tip of my ear off and grazed the side of my head. And uh, I was okay. I knew. I said, I can't, go, I can't go home and tell Mama what just happened. She'll probably beat me to death. <laughs> so we concocted a story. I fell off my bike and I fell on a piece of glass. And cut the tip of my ear and the side of my head. Well, I told her that. I don't know whether she believed it, but she took it and she took me to the hospital, to the clinic. And the doctor said, what happened? And I told him what happened. He looked at me with an eye as if he was like, I'm a doctor. That's not what happened. But graciously, he didn't say anything. He didn't question it. He just went ahead and sutured me up. That's number one. Number two. I think, I don't know which one of these happened first, but this is number two. We had a rifle in our home, a 22, two of them, one automatic and one just a single shot. I was too young to take it out. That's why the BB gun. But I would play with it at home sometimes when it was not loaded, you young folks. I could barely pull back the cock. and then squeeze the trigger and it would go click. And I would aim it. Usually I was in the bedroom and I would aim and I would pretend I was hunting. I did that several times one night by myself. 
it's hard to be by yourself in a family like mine. I had, I got seven brothers and I had three sisters. The next day, I was home alone and a young friend, neighbor, came by to visit. I don't know why, because he was, I don't know, five years or so younger than myself. He came by and probably looking for a younger brother. And we got to playing a little bit and talking and I pulled a rifle out. I was going to show him my skill. And I cocked it, and he was probably from here to that plant right there from me, in the bedroom. And I pointed it square at his head. I couldn't miss. And as I began to squeeze that trigger, my better sense said, ah, just raise it above his head a few inches. And I squeezed it, and that round went off. Shot a hole in the wall. And at that moment, I realized just how close his life and my life almost changed. I swore him the secrets. I said, you can't tell anybody about this. And as far as I know, he never did. He died at an early age. He was only 21 or 22 when he died in a car accident. But nobody ever said anything about that. And I didn't tell anybody about that for years. I eventually told my mother about the bike thing, and that it was really not a bike. Why am I telling you these stories? As I'm singing those hymns and it's promising heaven, I see how the Lord has led me, even as a child, how he kept me from myself when the enemy was trying to take me out the Lord put his hands there and stayed my hand and said raise that rifle heaven I'm not going to sit here today and stand here and go on and on about all the joys of heaven because the Bible plainly tells us that I has not seen nor has he ear heard. But by faith we can see it. And when we sing God's praises, the angels sing along with us. You get, we get a little glimpse of what heaven is going to be. Because in heaven we are told that we're going to sing what? The song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Well, the song of Moses is the song of the faithful throughout the history of of God's people. You go all the way back to Moses and all the way up to our day. That's the song we're going to sing when we get to heaven. We can't sing it now, but we can sing when we get to heaven. Then we're going to sing the song of the Lamb. That song has never been sung. So when we're singing hymns, let's project ourselves right on into heaven and sing the song of the Lamb. The lamb who was bruised, who was mistreated, who was nailed to a cross, who bled and died for me. I'm not going to say for you, I'll leave that for you to say. He died for me. And of all the things that I know, the most important is to know that Jesus died for me. Now, because we were talking about heaven and we were talking about songs, I want you to sing a chorus with me. It's not in your hymnal. We're going to have, some of you know it, some of you don't, maybe. It's in our Youth Sings book, and it's called Heaven Came Down and Glory Fill My Soul. How many people know that song? Got, got, got a couple. It's easy. The, the chorus is easy. But let me just read a verse, and then we'll sing together. I know I can count on my, my singing partners. Now, we can just sing it from where we are, and everybody just join in. It's easy. We may sing the chorus twice. But the song goes, Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, the day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the needs of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy I am telling. He made all my darkness depart. Second verse. Born of the Spirit, 
with life from above into God's family divine, justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a stand in his mind. And the transaction so quickly was made when at this, as a sinner I came, took up the offer of grace he did proffer. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Let's sing that chorus, and it goes, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul When at the cross my Savior made me whole My sins were washed away And my night was turned to day Heaven came down and glory filled my soul I'm going to read the last verse and then Y'all kind of join in on that course this time. I think you got it. Now I've, I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure. There in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I receive. Let's sing that chorus. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross, when at the cross, my Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. What am I trying to say? To know Jesus is heaven. We can experience heaven here and now by knowing Jesus. We can't put it off until we get there. We got to. Part of my sermon is, is if we are going to inherit heaven, we got to have heaven in our hearts today, now, and tomorrow. If we don't have heaven in our hearts we're deceiving ourselves. We live in a lie. Let the joy of heaven come into your heart, into your life. Makes life a whole lot easier, a lot more pleasant. Let's pray for that right now. Eternal Lord God, our Father, we pray just now that you touch us from on high with your spirit. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us a little glimpse in heaven. Not in a selfish way do, do Lord. Do we want heaven. But we want to be a part of your gospel. A part of your work. And if you dwell in us. May some lost soul see heaven. And desire to have what we have. Christ Jesus. Amen. Some of you know that I work at a hospital, if you, if you could call it work, but I work there and I, I work as a, I do a lot of things, but my main job there is to be a greeter. I never saw myself doing that, but, uh, but what a blessing it is. And I work with a, a German fella, big, about 6'5", bulky. Real deep German accent. And he does everything by the book. You know, he says nothing that doesn't need to be said. Only that which needs to be said. He used to be that way anyway. And somebody come in and say, oh, I need to go have a little blood transfusion. And he'll say, talk to that lady over there. And they look at him like he's crazy. And I look at him, I'm like, he's a child of God. Been working with him now for, I don't know, six or seven months. He's changing. He's changing. People come in when he's not there and they tell me, they say, where's that other guy? They say, that, that Italian guy. I said, no, he's German. He hasn't been here but maybe six, or six years. Uh, he married an, an American lady over in Chipley, and he came here. I think they met online. He moved here and found a new home. They said, well, 
When we used to come in here, he was just mean. They said, but now he's changing. He says some of the same things you say. He helps us. Somebody come in and say, I, I need to go see my relative. I don't know the room number. He said, there's a the phone, dial zero. Operator will tell you. They said, that's the way he used to treat me. He said, but now he's doing something different. What has changed? Anybody? I don't know what has changed, but they say to me, they said, I think you're rubbing off on him. I said, well, I'll keep rubbing against him then. If that's working, we'll keep rubbing against him until he come to know that there's nothing unique about me but the God that I serve, Jesus Christ, is the Lord. I love stories. But let's talk a little bit about, let's go to the scripture that we read. Turn in your Bible to 25, Matthew chapter 25, and looking at verse 31. I'm not going to wait for you for the sake of time. I'm going to go ahead and read. When the Son of Man shall come in the glory, his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Come. Verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare it for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me strength. Drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. So the Lord looks at the very least of the acts that we do in kindness as we are doing it to him. And some of you don't know that just this morning we had some visitors. They didn't come to church. They, they, need, they were in need of food. And one of our dear members took care of that need. I don't have to call a name. But she's sitting right there. She came into the classroom to get some things out of the pantry, and I said, do you need some help carrying it out to the car? She said, no, I got it. I said, would you just indulge me and let me help you take it out? I want to meet these people. I had already met the daughter. There was a mother in the car. I didn't know that the mother is a cancer patient, and she is falling on bad times. Her daughter is not from here, but she came here to help her mother out, and here we are on the corner, a beacon, right here on the corner of Kingswood and Deer Point Lake Road. She came in for help. So we took the stuff out, we put it in the back of the car, back seat, and um, met the lady, the mother, she didn't look well at all, but she was cheerful, warmed my heart. She was so happy to receive the blessing that the church was able to offer. And I asked, I said, could we pray with you? She, oh, yes, please. So we prayed with them. And they drove off. New friends for Jesus. And we didn't have to do any of that. We could have said, come back tomorrow, this is the Sabbath. But we did what needed to have been done. And as we were getting ready to come back into church, one of our dear sisters drove up, Sister Marcy. She drove up. I guess she had dropped somebody off. Um, I don't see him. Your son. And she said, I'm not going to attend church today. Just lost my brother this week, and my mother is very low sick. Another opportunity. Can we pray with you? We did. We prayed with her and she gave us hugs and she went on her way. What I'm trying to say is 
When heaven lives in the heart, this work is easy. I should have got a resounding amen. amen. Thank you. When heaven resides in our hearts, it's easy to do what the Lord requires us to do. Now, having said that, next week, it's 27, right? Next week? That's when we're going to go out and we're going to hand out some, some flyers. Let me be the first person to tell you that I hate that with a passion, but I do. I hate it. It's just making that first step. Once I'm out there, it's fine. You meet some nice people, and you're doing the Lord's work. But I still had to get myself dressed to do that in mentally. I'm not the only one. But we're going to do that next week. So bring your walking shoes. And after potluck, we're going to go and we're going to knock on a few doors and chat with some people. And if they're not home, we're going to leave something on their doorknob. Not in their mailbox, on their doorknob. What are we trying to do? We're trying to make friends for God. We're on our way to heaven. One of the songs that we sang during the song service had some words that mentioned something about... Um, um, Jubilee. Believe it was in Jesus saves. It's almost time for the earth jubilee. You know what I'm talking about? This old earth is about 6,000 years old. There's a jubilee coming. It's called a millennium. You know where we're going to spend the millennium? In heaven. 1,000 years is a millennium. And we're going to sing them songs. I'm going to play the piano. Can't do it here, but I'm going to do it over there. We're all going to play. We're all going to play harps. Servant of the Lord says we're not going to strum haphazardly, but we're going to play with skills as if we've already always had them. We're going to actually play the song that's in our hearts now. The song of the Lamb. We're going to sing and we're going to play. And it says that we're going to make the rafters in heaven ring. Do you know that there's one song that the angels won't be able to sing? That's the song of overcoming. For they never had to overcome. We will be elevated Because Jesus descended. Went to the cross. Wasn't easy for him. You know what got him through? L-O-V-E. Love for you, for me, and love for his father. So you see, I think of a father. I think of my father. He wasn't a big man, but in my eyes, I was little. He was a big man. He had a big old heart. He loved all of his 11 children. Yes, he did. He loved them all. And I didn't find out until I was maybe 18, 19. I went away for the summer in New Jersey, and I was working a summer job. This illustrates the Lord our Father in heaven. Working a summer job, working five and a half days a week, this was in the early 70s. At the end of taxes and all that, my pay was $130. I was getting ready to go to college. Just finished high school. I had expected to make a lot more money. Working at a menial job, painting cylinders in a little factory. It was a messy job. The cylinders had chlorine in it. And sometimes they leaked and it was poisonous and it was ugly. But one weekend, I, the only day I was off was on Sunday. I was speaking to my mother one Sunday, and she detected, as a mother always does, at least, she detected that I was not happy. She said, what's the matter, son? You don't sound happy. I said, well, I'd be a whole lot happier if I was making more money. And she said, well, how much money do you make, son? 
And I explained to her, I made sure she understood. I work five and a half days a week, Monday through Friday, half day on Saturday, and I get my check. I make a hundred, I barely clear $130. I put the $100 in the bank. I keep the $30 for expenses to get to work for the, on the bus and for the buy myself lunch. I was looking for sympathy. I was looking for her to say, well, yeah, maybe you'll find a job, you'll do better. She didn't say that. What she said changed my life. She said, son, in a loving way, she said, you know, your father never brought that much money home in a week in his life. I stood up straight and I'm thinking, count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven kids. Got to feed them, clothe them. You know, all that goes with being a parent. How did they do it? There I was, I wasn't even paying rent. I was living with my brother, rent free for the summer. It pays to have a wise mother to know just the words to say. But our Father in heaven, it changed my whole outlook on money. I realized it's not how much you got, it's what you do with it. And the first thing you should do with it is give back, return to God what's his. Putting a lot in this heaven sermon here, that's because of all the things in life that I want, once I took hold of this idea that, that you seven day Adventists know what heaven is, I hadn't looked back. I fell down a few times, but I have not looked back. I was like, I gotta go to that place. I gotta go there. It's not the fear of hell. It's the fear of missing out on looking at God and hearing him say, son, daughter, you are mine. You've been mine from the foundation of the earth. I don't want to let my father down. Speaking of father, I want to see my earthly father there too. I lost him when I was six. And every time I look in the mirror, I see him. Because I look like him. Hope and salvation to the world. That's what we are. That's what God wants us to be. Hope and salvation to the world. Not us, but the Jesus in us. Let me give you another text to put a little meat on this bone. They that trust in the Lord, this is Psalm 125, verse 1 and 2. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed. Let me just put a point right there. You are a member of the family of God. Take this to heart. You cannot be moved unless you decide to be moved. Amen? What am I getting at? I know people who have left the church, not necessarily here, but the church at large, because somebody looked at them strange or said something to them that they didn't like. And they made a vow, never come back. And some of them never came back. My question to you this morning is, if that if you ever tempted of the devil to leave, where will you go? Where will you go? Even if you shoot me, Billy, I'm coming back. As soon as I heal up, I'm going to be back. That's my determination to make heaven my home. I'm going off on a trip next month to go see my brother, my youngest brother up in Pennsylvania. We intend to have a good time, but that's not my purpose for going. My purpose for going is to let my light 
the light of Jesus shine. Amen. Take him to church. Introduce him to others that I hope they will let their light shine. And to try to let him see a life in Jesus. How is the better life? You know. I read something yesterday or sometime recently where an ex-basketball player, some of you know who I'm talking about, he goes by the name of Shaq. You can't miss him, he's so big. And he's all over TV if you watch TV, I don't. But if you watch TV, he's always peddling something. Insurance, shoes, something. But what I read was is that he with what was with another semi-famous person, uh, an ex-heavyweight champion boxer. Can't call his name right now, but he bit somebody's ear off years ago. And the article said that he was with him. I don't know what they was doing, but he spent a million dollars just showing off. You know, showing him what he could do and what he, and what his friend couldn't do. It's a million dollars, nothing to me. I want to show my brother Jesus. Because he's my brother, I want him to be in heaven with me. And I also want him to realize that Unless he leads the way, his wife, his children, and his grandchildren may miss out on the opportunity. But if he accepts Jesus, he may save his whole family. I want y'all to be praying for my mission. His name is Earl. His wife's name is Susan. He has two daughters, two grown daughters. They're married. They got children. They all live in the same town. So my mission is cut out. I'm not up to the task, but Jesus is. He and I are going to spend some time doing some road tripping. We're going down to Maryland to visit another brother. We're going up to New York to visit some cousins. And I want him to help me as we go about those places evangelizing. He doesn't know all this yet. <laughs> As Goma Powell would say, surprise, surprise, surprise. But it's a good surprise. The tricky part is I can't go in my own strength. I have to go in the strength of Jesus. Let him lead. Let him show me what my brother needs. And that's my fear that I might try to get out ahead of the Lord. Pray for me. I don't want to do that. That I will give it all to Jesus, that he might have his way. I know he, he loves my brother more than I do. Because this same brother, when we was little, I did something to aggravate him. He got a knife, and he said, I'm going to kill you. He chased me around, but he was little. He couldn't catch me. I just ran laughing, but, but I love my brother dearly. I love all my brothers. It was the cross, the instrument of shame and torture, which brought hope and salvation to the world. The disciples were but humble men. Without wealth. And with no weapon but the word of God. Yet in Christ's strength. What did they do? They went forth and they told the whole world. The wonderful story of the manger. And the cross. They had some triumphs over opposition. They had no earthly honor or recognition. They were heroes of faith. Peter, James, John, Paul, Mark. I can't name the rest of them, but they all are heroes. Because they followed Jesus faithfully. Jesus is looking for some heroes at the end of time. I don't know whether you notice or not. Some of us Adventists, we tend to shut out the world. We don't know what's going, watch what's going on very closely, but the world is coming apart at the seams. 
I don't mean, I mean that both literally and figuratively. The world is coming apart at the seams. Bible talks about war and rumors of wars. It's everyday conversation. Bible talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. We're living it. Talks about diseases and pestilences. We finally got brave enough. Some of us take our mask off, but it's not over yet. Monkeypox. Polio is back. Rivers are drying up, affecting commerce in various places. Southwest United States is several states out there. I think seven of them are worried about where they're going to get their water from. Colorado River is that dangerously low. The Rhine River over in Germany and France in that area is so low that the barges and the boats can't, can't come through at full capacity, which affects commerce, which affects everything, makes our prices go up. We're not going to talk about the mad men of the world, but we got them too. And I'm not just talking about the ones we know are mad. Some of the ones who seem to be on the good side, they mad too. Because it's all being orchestrated by the great deceiver through men. We're living in the time of the end. If, if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. And by that same token, if the Lord ever needed a people who would stand up for him, he sure does need it now. And he is enlisting us anew every day, every Sabbath. He's not calling me to go to Africa or somewhere. He's just saying, where you are, represent me. Where you are, represent me in your own way. He's not asking you to be me. He's not asking me to be you. He's just asking you to represent Jesus, how Jesus has touched your heart. I like where he has put me. It's good when it's, when it's a good fit. It's great when it's a good fit. I get up in the morning looking forward to going to work. Looking for an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. Looking for somebody to pray for. Looking for somebody to share something. I had a young man came all the way from Tallahassee. He comes every day. He drops off supplies. I hadn't seen him in a couple of weeks, but he was by on Thursday, last day that I worked. And when he was done with his deliveries, he stood there and he talked to me for an hour. I said, you must be done for today. He said, no. He said, I got eight more stops to make before I go home to Tallahassee. So I asked him, I said, have you read that book that I gave you? He said, he said, I've read one chapter. I said, why? The week. Because ever since you gave me the book, I've been busy. I've been working seven days a week. The workload. He said, but that's not going to last long. I'm going to read the book, and when I read it, we are going to discuss it. I said, all right, amen. You read that book. I don't know what's going on in that young man's head. I don't even know his name. But I'm praying for him. That the Lord will let him see something in me. Christ Jesus. That he will keep coming back. He was one of the ones who told me about my German friend. He said, what didn't happen to him? He began to act like you. I don't know, because I hadn't given him anything to read. He hadn't shown any interest. And I don't push anything on anybody. It's as the Lord opened up the avenue, be ready to go in. Be instant, in season, out of season. When the Lord opens a way, speak a word for him. I went up to the fifth floor two weeks ago. One of my coworkers was not working that day. She came in. She had a hoodie on. She was trying to be, oops, excuse me. She was trying to be incognito. I didn't recognize her. I said, hey, how you doing? 
She said, I don't want anybody to know I'm here. I said, why are you here? It's your day off. She said, I'm going upstairs. I got a dear friend up there who is not doing well at all. And I just want to go up and see how, and I could see that she was kind of distraught. I said, what room is he in? She told me. Later on, I had to go deliver some flowers up there, not to that room, but I was on that floor and I saw her. She was tearing up. I said, what's the problem? She said, he's not doing well at all. He and his wife, or his wife is still with him. She said, and I want to get a chaplain to pray for him, but all the chaplains are gone. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I had these flowers in my hand, big thing, and I said, let me deliver these flowers. What room is in? I'll be there. We'll do this. So I went in, prayed for him and his wife and for my friend. I told him, I said, I'll come back and check on you. I went on Thursday. I checked on him. He's doing just fine. He's doing just fine. And uh, we're going to continue to work with them. You know, is they were saying, thank you for the prayers. And I'm like, All right, thank the doctors. Thank Jesus. Don't thank me. I didn't do anything. All I did was pray for you. That, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. If it's not, you work on that. You do a little bit, a little prayer. Grow in grace. Before you knew it, you be praying with the mailman, the mail lady. You know, I heard somebody telling a story about delivering flowers. That was you. I was back. That was that was you, right, Annie? Okay. You know my story of delivering flowers. So you got to understand when my friend left the flowers here two weeks ago. I got pictures of them. They still they still look like new. I showed them, I shared them with them, some of them. I took pictures yesterday. The flowers still look fresh as new, some of them. The roses didn't make it, the other ones did. But they gave me so many flowers. I said, I can't take all these flowers home. Brother Oral was with me and Sister Precious as we went home. I made three stops. First house, nobody was home. Second house, the lady was home. These are people that I know from a distance. I don't know their names. But I shared the flowers with the lady and I said, now I need to explain to you, I don't want you to think the wrong thing, this man bringing you flowers. These flowers come from the church. One of our members worked for a florist and we had all these extra flowers, a truck turnover or something, she brought all these flowers. And I don't need them all, I just wanna share some with you. And she said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I said, have you, um, have you read my book? She said, it's back there on my desk. She said, I read, I read the first six pages. How come? Then she asked me a question. She said, what's your faith? I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. She said, where you go to church at? I said, out there at Southport on Kingswood and Deer Point Lane Road. She said, I know where it is. I work out there. She said, excuse me, she said, also, I know about a lot about you, Advent. And she said, the only thing that I don't agree with you on is the Trinity. Somebody sent me something last night that I'm going to give her on the Trinity that I hope will, I wanted something like trying to, I hope will, because, you know, these people nowadays, they don't read. They wanted something electronic, so I'm going to get that to her after I review it myself. But I told that lady, I said, you know, just to divert her a little bit, I told her, I said, you know, I said, the only thing unique about us Adventists is not so much that we keep the Sabbath. I don't think she has a problem with that. Her problem is just with the Trinity. I said, the only thing unique about us is not the Trinity. The only thing unique about us is the sanctuary doctrine. I said, I'm not going to try to tell you what that is, but if you read that book, you'll know all about it. She said she would. Then we went on to, and I talked to her for a while because she didn't let me go. Good thing we have air conditioning or they would burn up. We went to the next house. Lady came out. I gave her the flowers. I said, make, I, I knew her husband. I knew her husband. I said, now, you know, on, you tell your husband these came from the church. They didn't come from me. 
I'm not trying to get in trouble with your husband. But I am trying to make friends for Jesus. Every day, every step of the way. Let me let you in on one of my secrets. Luke, this one is for you. I don't think he heard me. Let you in on a little secret. The way I work, they have a piano down on the first floor across from the cafeteria. And when I first went to work there, I would go down and I would play it every now and then just for a few seconds. That was a way for everybody in the hospital to know who I am. I don't know who they are, but they'd be calling me by name. How you doing, Curtis? As they're in, coming in and going out, how you doing today? And I'm like, I don't know you, but I want to. The CEO of the hospital, her lady, I don't know her name. I do know, but I can't recall it. I'm getting old. Don't hold that against me. She came by one day, three weeks ago. She said, good night, Curtis. And I said, I need to speak to you. Sometimes you just got to be bold for the Lord. She said, what is it? I said, you got that piano down there. She said, yeah. I said, it needs to be tuned. She said, I'll take care of that. I will call somebody and I will take care of that. Well, the very next day, her lieutenant came up to me and said, we're going to get that thing tuned. Last week, they got it tuned. I met the piano tuner. Found out that he plays in a lot of churches around town. He's a good pianist. I said, give me your card. Give me your number. I want you to tune my piano. And while you're tuning my piano, I want to share Jesus with you. Simple as pie. I asked him how much his fee was. He told me, 100 bucks. I said, well, I live way out. He said, doesn't matter where you live, 100 bucks. I said, I, said, I will be calling you. I need to go now and get my piano out of tune a little bit so I can keep him in my house for He'll take him an hour or two to tune it, and we, he'll be a captive audience. Now, when he comes into my house, some of you have been in my house. I, I'm thinking of oral. You're going to realize that I have books everywhere, all over the place. Spirit of Prophecy says, we should, if you have kids especially, you should have books, good books, our books. No novels, good books, so that the kids can read about Jesus at a young age, that that seed can be sown. I keep books everywhere. Everywhere I turn, there's a book. And if I'm sitting there looking out the window, I can pick up a book. As I'm admiring nature, I can pick up a book. I can read a passage and reflect on God's mercy. I got rid of the TV. Nothing on it but garbage. Don't shoot me. Nothing but garbage. I'm closing now. And my closing thought is simply this. For us to live in heaven. I already said this, but this is a theme that I find over and over in the spirit of prophecy. Heaven has to first reside in your heart. Because if you don't love your fellow man, you can't love the Father. You can't love Jesus. And let me just add to that quickly. That's not saying you got to like everybody. Some people you can't like. I got a brother that I can't like, but I love him. Because he knows everything. Before I ask the question, he, he already knows the answer. But I love him to death. And 
my greatest joy would be for he and I, not my youngest brother, this is an older brother, for he and I to be in heaven. And when we try to remember the bad times, we can't even remember it. That's heaven. Amen. Just before we have our benediction, you probably noticed that the order of our service is a little bit, been tweaked just a little bit. So it, so it was a little bit awkward, but we're going to get that smoothed out as we go on. So just be patient. It's going to pretty soon all eight cylinders will be hitting as we do our service. And, and I think it's going to make us, um, it's going to make, it's going to be for the good, for the better. Let us pray. Our Lord God, our Father, there is power in the blood. We have experienced your power. And we pray, O oh Lord, for greater power. We pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon us. We pray, O oh Lord, for the latter rain in our hearts, and individually and as corporately as a church. Not only us, but all of your churches, all of your people, wherever they are. We pray that you pour out your spirit upon them so that when they hear the word of truth, they will respond. And we, O oh Lord, come today to give ourselves to thee fully. I pray that we might be used of thee to hasten the coming of Jesus Christ, that we might inherit the dimensions that we have, that we might stand on streets of gold, and that we might recognize and realize that heaven forever is our home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching our videos. If you like it, click here to watch another. Remember to subscribe and to share it with others so they can hear the gospel as well. God bless you.